written by a choir director in Surrey, British Columbia. It could have been written by our own Mark Cleveland, as they also, as you'll see, practice on Thursdays. <laughs> I dedicate it to our choir. Let us pray. Dear Lord, a song in our hearts brings us here to your house. Love in our hearts brings us back to these friends. Sometimes a Thursday can be a discouraging thing, a stretch of time perhaps more to be endured than enjoyed. The thought of leaving home's haven to venture out on a cold winter night, unappealing. What a joyous surprise then, each week, to find that friends are still true. That music still sings in our hearts. That an evening's journey reluctantly taken has been wholly worthwhile. We journey in your love, Lord, and your song in our hearts brings us joy. Amen. Amen. There is a novel titled Anansi Boys, telling the story of how Anansi, the African spider god, becomes human and has two sons. It is a really weird book. I do not recommend it, having read it. Yet it contains remarkable turns of phrase, including this one. Each person Whoever was, or is, or will be, has a song. It isn't a song anybody else wrote. It has its own melody, it has its own words. Very few people actually get to sing their song. Most of us fear that we cannot do it justice with our voices or that our words are too foolish, too honest, or too odd. Each person, whoever was, or is, or will be, has a song. A song no one else can sing. We see this in our biblical ancestors. Noah sings a song of faith. Abram, a song of trust. Mary sings a song of yes, Lord, I will. Esther, a song of justice. The interesting thing about Sarah, though, is throughout her journey, she likes to change her tune. A lot. No surprise as the name Sarah comes from the Hebrew Sar, a word meaning chieftain, ruler, captain. Abram may have technically been the head of the tribe, but let's be blunt, Sarah wore the pants in the family. She directed the choir. Forget the lead article in Atlantic Magazine's May issue this year claiming there is a devastating shortage of confidence in women across the world. Sarah would have never had time to believe in the content of the article, much less read it. She was too busy shaping the future. Her future. Her husband's future. The tribe's future. We all know bossy, pushy women like that. People, you're all staring at me. <laughs> William Ernest Henley wrote, I am the master of my fate, the captain of my soul. Sarai, wife of Abram, believed this. She projected confidence and control, and in her story, we see our own story, how sometimes we actually
actually believe that by our own voices, verb, and vision, we can move the hand of God where it should go. In Genesis 12, we first hear about Sarai going with her husband Abram to Egypt. Favorite verse, verse 14, in Abram, listen to it, husbands. Abram describes Sarai as stunningly beautiful at the tender age of 65. <laughs> he was so worried about how beautiful Sarai was that he asks his bride to sing a song, a new song, of dishonesty. Towards Pharaoh. Just tell him you're my sister. <laughs> I have to half lie as Sarah was his half sister. Sarah's song brings plagues to Egypt, oh well, whatever, but no wealth to her husband. Chapter 12, verse 16. Because of her, Abram, got along very well, accumulated sheep, cattle, donkeys, servants, and camels. Each person, whoever was, or is, or will be, has a song. Song no one else can sing. Sarah really does sing many different songs along the way. God tells Abram their descendants will number the stars. The problem is there is God's timeline and Sarah's timeline. And for Sarah, God's promise doesn't happen half fast enough. So she sings a song of manipulation. Hear the message translation of what Sarai says. God has not seen fit to give me a child. Abram, sleep with my maid. Maybe I can get a family from her. Then the next verse says this. Abram agreed to do what Sarah said. <laughs> Observe. No discussion over morning coffee about this strange request from Abram. No, honey, don't you think that idea is a little great, <laughs> But think about it. Your beloved walks up to you and asks you politely and clearly, Please, sleep with this woman. You have my blessing. Get her pregnant. Take as long as you need. Commit to the task 100%. Make it so. Who wouldn't turn that kind of offer down? <laughs> so Abram does what his wife asks. He gets Hagar pregnant, and then you notice Sarai changes her tune again to a tune of whining. She says, it's your fault I'm suffering with this abuse. I put my maid in bed with you, and the minute she knows she's pregnant, she starts treating me like I'm nothing. Sarah's song 
In his novel, Putting Away Childish Things, Marcus Borg writes, you know that biblical phrase, fear not, do not be afraid? Somebody told me that it occurs 365 times in the Bible. One for each day of the year. Sarah may look confident and act confident, but threaded through her many songs is really only one song. The song of fear. Fear of disobeying Pharaoh, fear of remaining childless, fear of playing second fiddle to Hagar, fear of Abram loving Hagar, loving Ishmael more than her, more than Isaac. Fear consumes Sarah, composes the music of her life. While Hagar and Abram choose to sing songs of faith, songs with lyrics like, Lord, I believe you are with me in the desert. Lord, I trust you. Lord, I love you. Lord, if you say, go here, believe, do this, I will. And friends, therein lies the choice. Singers of all ages, isn't it true that when you sing, you have a choice? You can be frightened. You can't sing at all. Or you believe that you can All of us choose whether to sing a song of fear or sing a song of faith. And today in all the scriptures we hear what song we're called to sing. In Genesis chapter 21, the angel of God calls to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid. For God has heard your voice. In Matthew, we hear part of the pep talk Jesus gave to his disciples as the twelve were about to strike out on their first missionary journey. Not a very peppy pep talk. Kind of a downer. As Jesus prepares them for the worst, says things, if you back up the speech to what we haven't heard today, Things like, you might be flogged, arrested, you'll be sheep among wolves, brother will betray brother, father will betray child, you'll be persecuted because you know me. But, today we hear not once, not twice, but the power of three times, have no fear. Do not fear. Do not be afraid. Towards the end of Anansi Boys, Neil Gaiman writes, People take on the shapes of the songs and the stories that surround them, especially if they don't have their own songs. Songs remain. They last. A song can last long after the events and the people in it are dust and dreams are gone. That is the power of songs. Today, we give thanks for our choir for the power of their songs, for the songs sung in this church, individually and collectively, songs of faith, hope, comfort, and love. Friends, be not afraid. 
Be bold. Stephen Sondheim writes, If I cannot fly, let me sing. Sing a song of faith. For no one can sing it like you. May those who have ears to hear, hear. And those who have voices to sing, sing.